Well, welcome everybody to yet another fascinating conversation. And uh, before I start, I'm sure you will all ag agree uh, with me reading uh, the introduction, which is as follows, and I think we agree on its importance. I would like to take the time to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam peoples. I would also like to acknowledge uh, that you are joining us from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Well, today it gives me very great pleasure to uh, add to the excellent introduction that our guest today, uh, Professor uh, Frank Tester, uh, made uh, uh, for us all and uh, say that perhaps he will allow me to say that I have a, a, an interest in an area where he has true knowledge and understanding. Uh, for me, it's the sort of largely failed modernist architectural enterprise in the Arctic. And having recently read a book, which of course cites Frank's work, Melanie McGrath's uh, The Long Exile, maybe we'll come back to that. What's particularly interesting to me is the very wide geography of activism and research from the Arctic to Latin America to East Africa uh, of uh, Tess, uh, Frank's work. And of course the breadth of practice um, uh, from scholarship to documentary filmmaking, radio broadcasting, plus a equally remarkable wide range of interests from farming and dry walling uh, recently last week <laughs> on Denman Island uh, to sailing and poetry. You all know he's Professor Emeritus at UBC, uh, but he's worked at York University and remains an adjunct of the University of Manitoba and of the Kootenay Art Therapy Institute at Nelson. What I'm sure um, many of you will know more directly and what fascinated me by doing the preparation for this work was the truly um, remarkable series of collaborative publications uh, on the provision of social welfare in Canada and perhaps even more importantly, Frank will tell us, the recovery and protection uh, of Inuit society and culture. And among his uh, many uh, honorifics was the award of the Gustavus Award for the study of human rights in North America. And Frank, will you allow me to say that I think that award is the leitmotiv of your contribution to scholarship and reform social policy. Now, um, in the title to this talk, which you gave a very good title, if I may say so, on the other hand, would you, would you be prepared to begin in Mozambique and then come back to the Arctic? Well, I can do that. Um, I should start though by saying that I've, I've always had some difficulties with the concept of human rights. And I think uh, this is rather relevant to what we're looking at at the present moment, especially with uh, you know, Wellington Street and Ottawa aligned with um, transport trucks, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we have in this country, and I remember uh, being involved with this when Trudeau was putting together the 1982 uh, revisions and changes to the Canadian Constitution, you know, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, and I remember a struggle with the concept, uh, this got public, uh, of collective rights. Uh, but it's, it's missing something. Um, we, we needed a charter, not just of rights and freedoms, but of responsibilities and obligations. And I think it's understandable and it's quite appropriate and it was necessary that there was a focus on human rights, especially after World War II and the, the UN Declaration. But I think that uh, we've got ourselves in a mess. And the mess that we're in, I think, is the result of a focus on human rights, uh, and the neglect of uh, responsibilities and obligations. Uh, so we have this celebration of freedom and human rights. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cry that fits nicely with capitalism, capitalist expansion, and a focus on the individual. 
because rights are seen to be individually held. In fact, they're expressed that way in many documents uh, you know, over and over again. Um, and um, we all have to live together. So the concepts of um, obligations and responsibilities, I think, are something that we have sadly neglected. And in terms of geopolitics and what's going on in the world right now, I think that focus on human rights, which was necessary and appropriate, but incomplete, because with them go, you know, obligations and responsibility is something that um, explains the mess we're in at the moment. And how that relates to Mozambique, well, uh, my work in, in Mozambique was very much related to the signing of the, uh, the, the peace accord, which ended the struggles between the government forces and the forces of Renamo and Ferlimo uh, fighting in uh, Mozambique. And many of you remember, of course, the focus was on landmines and uh, the removal of landmines. But uh, landmines weren't the only problem. Uh, by some estimations, um, you know, in a population at the time of about 19 million people. There were about 50 million AK-47 assault rifles in the country. People had them uh, under their bed, stacked in the attic, uh, in the woodshed out back, uh, you know, all over the place. So what I got involved in was an attempt to um, uh, eliminate uh, these weapons by trading them for community development tools. So with an organization called the Christian Council of Mozambique, which had a presence all over the country, we designed and executed a program where you give me X number of AK-47 assault rifles and, and uh, we'll give you a bicycle, or we'll give you X number of zincs for your roof or X number of bags of cement, or uh, you know, I, one, one occasion I remember giving away a plow um, etc. I mean, sewing machines. I mean, the list is long. I mean, anything that w w was people needed and that was practical and that they could use to either sustain themselves or make a living, um, we traded for AK-47 assault rifles. So we collected all these guns. What the heck are you going to do with all of these guns? <laughs> so the idea came up to um, take these guns and hand them over to artists after we had you know, made sure that they weren't usable, but they did a great job of finishing that off because what they did is they cut them into pieces and welded them back together and made sculptures out of these weapons, handguns, um, AK-47 assault rifles. Uh, it was a fascinating experience. Um, and I ended up not only participating in the design and execution of it, but I also ended up doing a critical evaluation of it for, uh, well, two organizations in Canada that were involved, and there were a number of organizations uh, all over the world involved in funding this, but it was funded by um, CUSO uh, and by the Canadian International Development Agency, as it was called at the time in Ottawa. So I ended up doing an evaluation so they had some idea of you know, how their money was spent. But the result was fabulous. I mean, these pieces of art have wound up all over the world. There are a number of pieces that are still sitting in the, uh, in the plaza in front of the uh, United Nations in New York. Uh, we did a tour of small pieces to high schools across Canada, talking to students about peace and, and reconciliation, um, uh, restorative justice practices. Um, I also got involved with uh, the restoration, you know, because many children were involved as child soldiers. And I worked with groups that were dealing with uh, child soldiers in Mozambique and really difficult situation because um, they, for, they, they, there were child soldiers on both sides of the fence, but primarily Renamo, the resistance organization that had its origins in what was then Rhodesia under Ian Smith uh, and, and so South Africa before uh, the end of uh, apartheid with uh, uh, that particular regime. And these were kids that were, of course, abducted from rural schools, especially in the Gorongora province. 
and uh, they would be uh, taken back into camps. They, they would be, uh, you know, given shoes and a uniform. And, and not all of the child soldiers were children that were kidnapped. I mean, some of them signed up because they were promised uh, uh, three meals a day and uh, a new pair of running shoes, um, etc. But they, they would get dr them drugged up and send them back to the village from which they came, where they would kill their relatives and members of their own family. So I ask you, you know, how do you restore somebody back to their community and their family after an experience like that? And, no, it's too uh, terrible. It was remarkable, but it was remarkable to see how this was done. And this is where my interest in different forms and the cultural ways, different cultural ways in which restorative justice is practiced get used. I spent a lot of time talking with, um, in fact, I'm sitting here and looking at my wall. I have pictures of uh, the portraits that I, I took of um, some of these child soldiers that I, that I worked with and interviewed hanging on my wall here. Um, and uh, an amazing experience. Um, uh, that's all I can say. The whole thing, the whole thing, you know, the turning art arms into art, uh, exchanging arms for uh, community development tools, dealing with child soldiers, restorative justice in a totally different uh, cultural context. Oh, the whole thing was absolutely yeah, one of one of the most interesting experiences of my life. Well, I think we're going to come back to the importance of, of practice in, in your thinking about uh, research. But I was reminded while you were talking, of course, of that rather fine portrait uh, sculpture of uh, George Washington with swords literally being turned into plowshares. But can I move us to um, the, the title, uh, and I hope I don't mispronounce this, Tamananit, the Inuit Relations Mistakes, I think is my Tama, Tama Nahi. Tama yes Nahi. thank you and yeah. and and I apologize before we started that I didn't want to uh, uh, insult uh, um, the Inuit by by not really being able to pronounce it because it's a very complex language that's okay we all but, do it everybody uh, does they're quite I mean, used to it and it's, they it's a great enjoy word it. <laughs> mistakes and I think you think uh, uh, following on what you've just said Frank I mean a lot of your your work and your life has really been dedicated to dealing with particularly the, the harsh colonial um, modern regime. I, I suppose Max Weber was thinking about it as the iron cage of progress. So may, maybe we could lead you back into the Arctic and particularly your work um, at Pond Inlet, but not only that, and as a consultant to the government of Canada to trying to find a way to undo some of the mistakes where I suppose you would say we felt always we knew better. Well, we're, we're, we're undoing some and we're uh, replacing them with uh, new forms of the same kind of thing. Uh, colonialism, yeah. isn't, colonialism isn't over. Uh, what's no. going on in, what's going on in Mozambique, for example, in, uh, in some provinces uh, with international mining companies is, is absolutely horrifying when I look at the impact on local populations, cultures, and the yeah. landscape environment, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. It's just you know, laying provinces of Mozambique rich in coal and iron ore to absolute waste. Um, I was there recently uh, before, just before COVID uh, descended upon us. And, doing some restorative justice training with young people and others in this particular province and uh, spent some time looking at, you know, what development looks like there. But I, we're doing the same thing in Canada. I, I'm dealing with a, a mining project on the northern tip of Baffin Island, um, Mary River Iron Ore Mine, uh, developed by a Oakville-based Canadian mining company called Baffin Land. Um, and they are currently producing about 6 million tons of iron ore a year, which gets shipped uh, across the uh, northern North Atlantic to uh, Rotterdam um, to feed the uh, German steel industry. Um, 
They want to double production from six to 12 million tons. They want to get rid of a tote road that they use to haul by truck the ore to port and replace it with the first ever Canadian Arctic Railroad, which has to be built on a berm, of course, above ground, about three meters above to protect the permafrost and to uh, deal with you know, undulations in the landscape, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and increase by doubling the shipping through a marine conservation area, which the government created in 2008, uh, south of Beelot Island, which is the island that is a large island off the northern coast of uh, Baffin Island. Um, it, it's ridiculous. I mean, they're proposing to uh, 176 warships plus using ice breaking to extend the shipping season um, through what is biologically probably the richest area of the Arctic, home to the largest population, migratory population of narwhal in the world. Beelot Island is also um, Arctic birds galore. Um, the uh, caribou population on Baffin Island is currently uh, in crisis. It may be recovering, uh, but there is no, basically no hunting of caribou worth speaking of on Baffin Island because the numbers have crashed. And of course, the railway runs right through what uh, elders and others uh, know as prime caribou breeding grounds and calving, calving grounds and, and feeding grounds. And it's where they used to hunt. So the anguish over this and the conflict and problems over this are many, because at the same time they say, well, jobs, you know, what are young people going to do? I mean, you know, it's that classic argument of the environment versus jobs and protection of a incredibly important uh, um, ecosystem. So um, I, I was I was uh, asked to uh, work with uh, Pond Inlet primarily, which is the or Mittimetallic, the Inupitut name for Pond Inlet, and people there um, as a technical advisor to interpret the uh, results of the research that the company was has to do in order to make application to the Nunavut Impact Review Board and ultimately to the federal government for permission to go ahead with this development. So I, I've been in that up to my eyeballs for the last oh, at least three years, three and a half years, I guess, which is uh, quite a long time for a project to get consideration, but we've been shut down a number of times by COVID and things have you know, been complicated and confused as a result of that. Um, another, you know, what can I say? Another absolutely interesting and, and really demanding experience um, where I, I, I learned a lot and, um, and consequently have, uh, you know, some really solid insights, I guess, into the idea of progress in relationship to current social and environmental issues, climate change being, of course, right up there with them. Um, this this uh, expansion will double the emissions of, of carbon, carbonous compounds in the entire Canadian Arctic. You know, the, 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 the railway and the shipping alone will, will it's going to double uh, carbon emissions. So I want to see how the federal government deals with this. But the other thing is that uh, I don't know how many of you that are listening, uh, you know, have ever heard of this before, but the truth of the matter is most Canadians know nothing about this. You know, this is what's going on in our backyard as I speak. So uh, no, that, that's, 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 that's a large part of what I've been doing for the last three and a half years. Frank, have you thought about how we kind of step back um, from uh, that awful, it's like Scylla and Charybdis, isn't it? We're going to start be crashing on one side or the other. How do we step back from the fact that we're all really frankly implicated, particularly in the so-called developed world in this system, which is so destructive. I'm not inviting you to go into theories of capitalism and so on as such, but what are the that, steps? That would be, easy to, do. That would be easy to do, but, <laughs> um, but 
we're consuming ourselves to death. Yeah. Okay. Period. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. We are consuming ourselves to death, and 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 this gives rise. And that's this is colonialism and and the expropriation, which is what it is of indigenous properties and lands all over the world was all about. It's about capital accumulation, progress, and consumption. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's hard to lose money if you're a company like the Canadian Pacific Railway or the Hudson's Bay Company. If the government just by a charter gives you, you know, a, a huge chunk of a continent that uh, and says it's yours to exploit. Uh, and, and we're we're uh, and this this is where the the words I'll get a little bit off topic here, but this is where the word settler really bothers me. I mean, uh, this is the this ties into the other theme, you know, it's about belonging, my own feelings about belonging or not belonging in the academy. Um, <clears throat> when I when I look at the history of Canada, and I look at, for example, uh, Scottish and uh, Irish immigration to Canada, and what happened with the Selkirk settlement, for example, what happened in Cape Breton, what happened in Toronto, Nova Scotia, what happened in much of southern Ontario, etc, etc, etc. And then I look at the, the what we're doing now, which is very postmodern in our language, especially. Um, and I certainly don't have any problem with the words colonialism or colonial, but I have a I have a real problem with people using use of the word settler. Because when I look at, or I'll just use this as one example, and I, I, it was because this is my my own you know family and cultural background is you know the. Highlands of Scotland and what happened to uh, the, the Celtic populations of of, uh, of the Highlands of Scotland and the um, the islands. Um, these people didn't come to Canada as settlers; they came as refugees. I mean, if you read the history of what happened to uh, with the clear the the clearances, the clearing of the Highlands, and how people were treated, and how how they wound up in Canada. And who they were and how they got here. Uh, using the word settler is just absolutely, you know, makes no sense to me at all. These people were refugees. They had no clue where they were going. Uh, they, they they were barely alive. I mean, people were put on cholera infested ships. Uh, you know, you could start off with a family of seven kids, and if you arrived with three of them, three of them still alive, in some cases you were doing quite well. It's a horrifying history. And that's that applies to the Scots. It applies to the Irish. It applies in different ways to Ukrainian populations that settled on the prairies. They settled, but to call, but the way in which the word settler is used in our our dealing with our the tragic and, and awful histories we have with indigenous peoples in this country, it it, it really bothers me. It's a it's a it's an exercise in, in, in righteousness, which is completely uh, off base. I mean, who settled uh, Canada? Well, I would say that the lumber barons settled it, the Canadian Pacific Railway settled it, the Hudson's Bay Company settled, and a whole lot of other capitalist interests are the ones that acquired the land. The people who ended up on it had no clue what was going on. We need a much more informed, and of course, this masks the relationships between expropriation, what David Harvey, a geographer, has nicely captured. He talks about accumulation by expropriation. You know, but the use of the word settler and confessing that, you know, I'm a settler and you know, this sort of righteous pronunciation that, and confession that people make masks, in fact, the real what really happened. It hides this history, and it, and it helps us to avoid dealing with things that we don't want to deal with, which is how the cultural and economic system that we're blessed with actually works. It disappears. And I think that's a huge, huge, huge mistake in, in current discourse around you know, Indigenous rights and, uh, and, and looking at you know, truth and reconciliation and what constitutes truth. Um, how did I get into that? Uh, <laughs> um, no, it's important. I mean, actually, Frank, I'll just pop in. I mean, it interested me a great deal that the sort of basis of colonial architecture goes back to Houghton Hall and to Robert Walpole, 
who got through Parliament some of the worst, uh, most punitive acts, the Black Acts, actually not to do with race, but people who were trying to exercise their rights in the commons to take things. Um, well, there were anyway, a I won't go with that, but it is Yeah, there were a proclamation in Canada is an interesting and controversial yeah. document in terms of that whole history. But yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, this is a postmodern problem. Our, our, it gets into issues around language and how language makes, you know, what's the relationship between history and la the language we use to capture and describe it? How do we write about these things? And the use of the word uh, settler is uh, hugely problematic for me in this discourse. It, it, it masks and hides a whole lot of things that we need to deal with. And that takes me back to, you know, the topic of climate change uh, and, and consumption. Uh, that's what we're looking at. When I look at Baffin land and the project I'm dealing with, I, I'm looking at uh, something that continues. And, and, and what is hugely problematic and has gotten us into a, well, quite frankly, I think into a, a, a problem that we may we may not recover from. I mean, this is uh, I, I'm not very I'm not very optimistic about. Uh, our capacity to deal to do what we need to do in order to uh, prevent what will be a, uh, a, not just an environmental but a social disaster. That's the no, I understand. Well, I, I think there's an aspect of, of your work which seemed to me to to have um, a, a more regenerative quality to it. I mean, your use of archival materials particularly photography and participatory research with Inuit colleagues. And can I quote something from Curtis Connick, if I'm pronouncing his name properly? You got it. Not, yeah. I did good. Not knowing who you are, where you belong, and not feeling good about yourself. And the fact that that project, I think, was both a revelation to him, but something which was a, a part of a rebuilding uh, of, of presence uh, and, and perhaps part of this practical work you did in Mozambique of turning nasty things into things that can be creative rather than destructive. Yeah, you're referring to a work I did with Inuit youth, which yeah. you know, I've, I've worked with Inuit youth well in one way or another, I think all my adult life off and on. This was, a, in fact, there's a, the, this is going to be, a, there's a chapter that I wrote with Curtis which is where that quote comes from, um, which is called uh, Picture This Self-Esteem uh, Project um, uh, Nanavara and Nanasinic uh, and Project Naming. Uh, this is a, a chapter in a book that's being published by McGill Queens, I think, as we speak. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's the book's entitled Atigut which in Inuktitut means our names. And the subtitle is uh, Inuit Oral History and Project Naming. Project Naming was uh, something that I, I was involved in with the National Archives. The Archives of Canada are full of, the Arctic collection of photographs is absolutely overwhelming and amazing. But of course, the pictures of Inuit are terribly labeled. You know, an Eskimo woman of the typical type. You know, this is somebody's great grandmother. Yeah. Uh, so what we did was we started taking these pictures out of the archival record and with Beth Greenhorn, who was absolutely amazing woman, who has put a lot of energy into this working for the Library and Archives of Canada, we started publishing sort of a picture every week in the in local newspapers, uh, the Natsiak News and uh, News North, and asking if anybody can identify the people in these pictures, you know, here's, here's who to send the information to. So we ended up identifying, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in photographs where they had no name. So this is called, this is called project naming. So the archival records have changed. Um, these people now have a name. And of course, photographs are, Receive very differently in Indian culture than they are than in our culture. We, we, we just take photographs for granted. I mean, there's so many of them, we're utterly overwhelmed. 
But because the wisdom of elders and the importance of the gifts they have given intergenerationally to Inuit are so important in Inuit culture, actually seeing a picture of your great grandmother, somebody you have never seen before, but who's whose stories you're familiar with, whose songs you may be familiar with, um, whose history you may have some knowledge of, is, it has an incredible impact on the viewer. And I've watched this when somebody, and Curtis is a good example, when he sees the pictures of his grandmother, you know, as a young woman living, uh, you know, uh, as she was in the southern interior of the Kivalik region, uh, uh, the, the, the significance of this is hard to put into words. So what we weren't just, you know, relabeling pictures that are found in the Library and Archives of Canada. Yeah, in terms of identity, self-esteem, recognizing, because you, you, you see the comb that his grandmother had long hair, this wonderful comb made out of bone you know, she was using to comb her hair and realizing how incredibly talented, artistic, talented and practical people were to survive, you know, under the most difficult conditions imaginable, makes you feel really proud to be a nook and really proud to, of your grandmother and really, you know, like you belong to a family that has a, a history uh, that's imbued with talent, uh, beauty, uh, essence, uh, you, know, you name it. So that's why we entitled the, the, this chapter, we put the word self-esteem in there. Because my experience of what I was doing, what I was trying to do, was to address the problem of young Inuit suicide without even mentioning it. Just by doing something, you know, involving them in, in, in uh, exploring archives and taking pictures of their own and making film of their own. I mean, I have sitting behind me in drawers here, you know, hundreds of hours of interviews on film with Inuit elders, interviews done by Inuit young people talking for the first time to their elders and grandparents about their life histories and Inuit culture. Uh, yeah, a huge impact on, these, on, on the self-esteem and the way in which young people come to look at and understand themselves. And self-esteem, as far as I'm concerned, is a major concern and consideration in understanding you know, the suicide rate among well, young, young Inuit males, which is, uh, well, the highest in the world. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder, while I, while I slightly switch tacks, do hold up that book we talked about before, because when I apologized to you about pronunciation, oh, you gave me a particularly, you you gave me a a particularly difficult one. <laughs> yeah. I completely failed, everyone. Yeah. Uh, Frank, well, I, 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 I'm going to bring you around, by the way, to uh, some more work you did, but do pronounce that name because it's, it's very interesting, please. It's, it's, it's part of, you know, language is, it can be a help and a hindrance, can't it? And I mean, the complexity of that word is fascinating. Yeah. Inuit kau yumeya tukangi. Yeah. It means literally what Inuit have always known to be true. It's and a you sentence, also it's a yeah, sentence in and one you, word. you mentioned something else, not to jump at you, and <laughs> apologies, but uh, something which was really intriguing to me, you know, we in English, as you said, we tend to kind of slop around getting to the point. But you said that most Inuit actually come up with a sentence after they thought about what they really want to say. Yes, that's because Anuktitut is a, a holophrastic language. In other words, you can get a whole sentence in one word. You start mm -hmm. with a root and you add suffixes and prefixes to elaborate on the basic concept until you have the whole thing together. So when you're speaking, you have to make that, you know, I have to do that mentally, do that action before you open your mouth, which means, you know, you really do have to think before you speak. We don't do that. You know, <laughs> English is a linear language. You start off and you have no idea where you're going to end up. The sentence may go here, it may go there, it may go nowhere. Uh, but, you know, you start speaking anyway, and it comes as you go. That, that doesn't work in an update. 
well, not to be facetious, but many people seem to do a lot of speaking without any thinking. Anyway, um, not going there too far. Uh, can I lead you into another fascinating part of your work, which is because a lot of your work has been both co very collaborative and participatory, but cross-disciplinary, whatever word you want to use there, uh, but bringing together very different approaches. I was fascinated by the collaboration with the Cree playwright, uh, René Morisot, um, as part of your work as president of the Vancouver Association for Restorative Justice. Maybe I could draw you out a little bit about that and other things that you've done similarly. Um. Well, yes, uh, I always been concerned about um, how one communicates uh, restorative justice to those who are interested in it, or maybe interested in using restorative justice to resolve conflicts and problems that they have with other people, or its use with regard to people who've been charged with an offense. Uh, and, and as an alternative to the court system. Um, but the problem is, um, you know, people ask, well, well, how does it work? You know, what does it look like? And that's where words fail me. <laughs> I can describe it verbally, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily help. And it certainly doesn't help depending on who it is you're speaking to. Uh, so I started thinking, you know, we, it would be nice to put a restorative justice process on film, uh, being someone who's interested in, in film for these kinds of purposes. But then, of course, you can't do that because a restorative justice process involves a lot of confidences and uh, you know a lot of things that you know, can't be made public. So then you get into some nasty problems related to production and you know, how you go about it and so forth. And so I talked about this with uh, with many people and. I, I do a blank, but then I thought, well, um, maybe it would be if we put a play together using restorative justice as the theme. If we had a play and and we um, we could act it out, you know, we could hire actors, maybe maybe um, do it like a radio play, you know, per, do a public performance of it. So we we did. We we um, we hired Renee Morisot, so an actor. Actor and playwright, Cree from Manitoba, fairly well known. She was really interested in it. We worked with her uh, back and forth. Uh, I sent her to uh, Nelson in the interior to meet with people that I know and work with there around um, you know, the art therapy program, but also in the restorative justice program that they have there. Uh, we sent drafts of material to the uh, restorative justice program in Victoria. Uh, we worked back and forth, back and forth, and but we came up with a play, which, by the way, you can it's online. And we we hired professional actors because we couldn't go ahead with the uh, the radio play performance, which we were going to launch at the Vancouver Public Library. Uh, COVID COVID came along and closed that down. So we said, okay, what do we do next? So what we did is we hired actors to read all the parts, and if you if you Google, you know. Um, uh, uh, Vancouver Association for Restorative Justice. You'll get our website, and there's a there's a link to the the the, the play uh, on that site, and the parts are read by professional actors, um, and it gives you a good idea of how restore a restorative justice process unfolds. Uh, and we have we printed uh, the the play. I have copies of, of it. We give out copies of it. Uh, I'm now doing some work in the uh, with others in the Vancouver Association for Restorative Justice, um, working with the um, youth, um, the uh, caring school liaison officers that have replaced the police department and their presence in schools in in the Vancouver School Board District. And what we're using is restorative justice as a way of dealing with um, many of the conflicts and problems around bullying, racism, anti-Semitism, you name it, that arrive, arise within the school system. So, you know, this play um, plays a role in that. And um, I've, I'm in the process of putting together a video short we filmed 
one of the key, the assault scene that is in the play. We filmed it in East Vancouver about uh, two months ago, but I'm also combining with B-roll and interviews with other people and so forth and so on to produce a video short about restorative justice that can be used for educational purposes. So, so that's that was the relationship that we had with Renee Morisot and uh, her play is. Um, it's available online. You know, the, the reading of it is can be found on our website, but we're also trying to produce a video short to go with it. This was all. Oh, well, that's fun. that's great. Well, well so that the, the, just to repeat the the site again. It's Vancouver Restorative Justice. The Vancouver that... Association for Restorative Association. Justice. Yeah. For Thank you. Justice. Frank, can I read something which I find highly interesting, um, and I, I'm probably on the the bad side in some way of this. The best critical inquiry originates with practice. It's being a witness to social justice, struggle, pain, and triumph that makes writing, studying, and teaching meaningful. The result otherwise is dry, unappealing, and frankly boring. A lot of academic work regrettably uh, wears this distinction. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to stick it to you. I think it's really interesting. And I, you know, I know I've failed on many occasions. Well, but it's I, hugely I, important. It, this gets me back to theory and, you know, how I, uh, I had no intentions of becoming an academic. I mean, I, I, I grew up in a very working class Scottish family. My, my father could barely read and write. He never got out of public school. My mother had grade 10 and eventually managed to get a, uh, go to normal school so that she could teach junior uh, grades in a one-room country schoolhouse kind of thing. And, you know, I, I had no, I had no intentions of becoming a part of the academy whatsoever. I and mean, there's a whole story behind how that happened. It was, you know, not something I had in mind at all. Uh, well, tell, tell us the story first. Well, I, I did my, I did a master's degree in environmental design and I, I lived, I spent most of my time when I was doing that living in Arctic Bay on the northern tip of Baffin Island in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I was really interested in, in design. I was interested in architecture and housing, but I, I'd done a degree in medical sciences and medical research. And so the connection between health, human health and housing really, really interested me. And what I saw going on in the Arctic was a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, the you know made in Saskatchewan summer cottages that were being sent into Arctic communities were, ah uh, you know just completely inappropriate uh, and and just did not work and were causing more problems than they were solving. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that I, I did that degree and then I decided that I, I watched the communication taking place between academics who were you know running into the Arctic to do studies on myself being one of them of course but I was I had a critical view of a lot of the other people that I encountered uh, physical scientists as well as social scientists and anthropologists and 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 uh, bureaucrats from Yellowknife coming in to try and solve problems of waste management and sewage disposal and everything else and I came to the conclusion that communication problems were huge <laughs> there was something wrong with the social interactions that were taking place here it wasn't just a matter of you know bad design and all kinds of uh, poor decision making when it came to infrastructure the communication that was taking place between people uh and the understanding people had of Inuit and, and what they needed and how they communicate and how they're organized was, was terrible so i decided to degree in social work with a focus on you know this kind of this kind of thing, I was incredibly lucky. I I I did my degree in Calgary, at the University of Calgary, where I encountered someone who uh, will live with me forever, and he was the dean of the school of get this social welfare, not social work, social welfare. Tim Tyler. Tim Tyler was a farm guy from Saskatchewan originally who had spent his time during the Second World War training uh, pilots 
using uh, small uh, soft with camels and you know other planes, that, you know, training British forces in Saskatchewan. And, and then, of course, he was, uh, after the war, could get, as the government did, he could get free education. So he came to the University of British Columbia School of Social Work to do his degree and didn't get along very well with the woman who was in charge of the program. And because he, he had a whole different idea of what social work was all about, hence the name of the faculty that he became the dean of. The Faculty of Social Welfare. She suggested he should go to the University of Toronto, so he did. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> but this man was amazing, and then he did a doctoral degree, he worked in New York, and he worked around another. He was amazing. He created a Faculty of Social Welfare, and his reason was that he thought that, that social work was far too narrow, but the real, what really needed to do, be done is human welfare needed to be dealt with in the broadest possible way. He was interested in community development. He was interested in social change. He was interested in social movements. He hired in this school of social welfare, the most amazing people, I, combination of people I've ever encountered in my life. It was a creative and really exciting place to be. He had he had a he had hired somebody who was from Britain who was uh, I forgot his name now James um, a futurist hmm. you know in the Alvin Toffler kind of way that a futurist yeah. is he hired a a, a an elderly uh, but very thoughtful philosophical uh, psychiatrist. Uh, who had the most radical and most interesting ideas about psychiatry. Many of them, you know, founded in the Frank Frankfurt School and, you know, mm -hmm. what, what was going on at the time. He hired a woman who had a degree in education who was interested in the relationship between, you know, schools and, and community development. The school is not just a place where kids get an education, but as a center for the for community and community activity, community growth and community change. So he hired somebody with a degree in education. I mean, he did hire a few people with degrees in social work. And I was I eventually not only did my degree there, but when as I was leaving, I had an old truck. I was carrying all my papers and stuff and I met him at the bottom of the elevator in the tower that the school was located in and he says what are you going to do with the rest of your life I said I'm getting out of here that's one thing I know because you know I, I really wanted to get away from the university and uh he said well what are you going to do and I said well I've, I've been offered a position uh, with uh, in child protection uh, just you know south of Calgary and one of the communities south of Calgary and I'd really like to do some farming and he looked at me and he said, oh, I have lots of experience with that. I came from a farm family. He says, hey, let me buy you a beer. So, you know, I ended up going to the, uh, the uh, student union building and having a beer with him. And he said, yeah, I just read your thesis. I said, oh, my God, I didn't think I better read that. He says, you know, well, and I also looked at, you know, the, what students had to say about you as a teaching assistant. And I said, oh, uh -oh. he said, you know, I, I think you're, you're going the wrong way. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, he said, you're going the wrong way. I said, well, I, I want to go. He said, you, you want to go farming? I said, yes, well, I'm going to work. And, you know, and then when then I have my eye on, I had my eye on a piece of property at Black Diamond, uh, Alberta, which was an old rundown farm that was, you know, the guy was in his 70s. His wife had died. His son wasn't interested in it. All the machinery was a mess. The house hadn't been touched since the 1930s. It was perfect for me. And he said, you can't do that. And I said, why not? He says, you need a wife and four kids to, to, to do farming like that. <laughs> and I, I thought, well, that's really insightful. He said, you go home and do the math and you come back, I'll buy you dinner tomorrow. I said, you gotta be kidding. He said, you, you do the math. I think you're going down the wrong road. And if you go home and do the math, interest rates were crazy in those days. Remember they were on their way to 21%. Yeah. At this time yeah. they were about 12. And he said, You've, how much are you going to have to borrow to pull off something like this? What's going what's to happen if interest rates go up another percentage? I said, they're not going to do that. They're so high now. It's ridiculous. He said, you don't count on it. He turned out to be right. I went home. I did the math. I realized if interest rates based what I had in mind and was plotting rose by half a percentage point, I was finished. You know, like I'd be in real serious trouble if I got into this. So I came back and, and he offered me a job as a sessional instructor. Marvelous. 
And I thought, and he said, this turns into a tenure track, you know, we're going to hire a tenure track position next year. And, you know, if you, you, there's a session on, you know, you'll be more than eligible for the position if you're interested. I, went back, I had an existential crisis. You know, I, I, I thought about this all weekend. I walked around. I didn't sleep. But, but I, you know, I, I don't belong in there. I didn't feel like I belonged. I never felt like I belonged in, in a university. I was a hands-on community guy. I was not interested in the, the culture of the academy. It, it turned me off. I felt like a stranger. My father wondered, you know, when I was going to get, you know, when I told him I was doing this, he said, yes, but what, what are you going to do for work? He couldn't believe that, you know, <laughs> that, that I would get paid to work in a university. Yeah, I didn't understand it at all. Um, so I, I I said yes, and uh, it was an, it, because I was and I had somebody else who wanted me, and he, he was the head of the Kananaska Center for Environmental Research, and they were fighting over me. And finally, they decided to give me a joint appointment. So I spent half my time with the School of Social Work, half my time with the Kananaska Center for Environmental Research, and. Um, that's how I got in. That's how I ended up in the university. It was not something I had ever, ever dreamed. Of. And then a year and a half later, I ended up chairing an inquiry before I was even 30 years of age. I ended up chairing an inquiry into the socioeconomic and environmental impacts of a crazy scheme called the polar gas pipeline mm. in the Eastern Arctic. And I worked with uh, the minister was Warren Almond, whom I had. Oh, had a direct contact with an amazing man. I said, do you realize, you know, when, when, he, when I got called to Ottawa to talk to him, I, 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 I asked him, I said, do you realize how old I am? <laughs> he said, yes, exactly. Do you realize how old most Inuit are? And of course, 50% of the Inuit population is under 25 years of age. And that was true in the 70s, and it's still true today. And they had, I had, because of my experience in Arctic Bay and people getting to know me, when he asked for a list of names of people to do this, my name showed up on the list. And I had done some mediation and negotiation between the community of Arctic Bay and the Nana Civic, the company building the Nana Civic Mine on the northern tip of Baffin Island. And my name showed up on a list that they put forward. So, you know, I was on both lists. That's how I think I wound up being asked to do this. I was terrified. I had no clue what I was doing. I, and I made it up as I went. And especially the social impact stuff, because, you know, environmental impact was being talked about, but social impact was still kind of an exotic, strange thing that nobody understood. And in the end, I, uh, well, I won't. You know, I'll get into the details of what I came up with and how I did it, but I got so caught up in it and I met so many interesting people. I got some money to sponsor a national conference on social impact assessment in Banff in 1981. And uh, a book came out of that. I edited a book on social impact assessment theory and practice with papers that people had written. And, um, yeah, that's how I got swept up. And then I ran away to New Zealand to do a doctorate degree. <laughs> yeah, that's how I got caught up in the academy. But I, 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 I still, I've always had, and even the day I left, I always felt like I didn't belong. I always felt like somebody was going to come down the hall behind me, tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, what are you doing here? What is somebody like you doing here? You, you know, this is not for you. <laughs> Well, happily, Frank, nobody did that. But just because we got to move into questions now, and, and I invite everybody to think of their questions, and I will do my best to field them. Um, to say a little bit more about this aspect of sort of um, highfalutin term is current discourses, um, particularly around uh, reconciliation. Oh, dear. Um... Well, reconciliation, truth, truth and reconciliation, is, as uh, Marie Sinclair has said, is, is for all of us. And it is definitely for all of us. Uh, despite all of my experience with Indigenous peoples, not just in Canada, but internationally, I never got to teach in this area at the university. 
at all. Uh, I think people thought it would be politically incorrect to have a white a white guy teaching you know anything about indigenous history or uh, mm -hmm. uh, but that was a mistake because I, I think we we all need to work together. You know, maybe team teaching is something that should happen there. Yeah. Uh, we all have something to contribute because after all, I mean, the half of the equation is us. We're the problem. I mean, it's our history and the way in which we've gone about things, which, you know, as someone was concerned about this, I know very well, you know, so this is half of the coin. And that's why Murray Sinclair is absolutely right. And I've talked to him about this, in fact, when I testified in, in front of a Senate around some of this stuff years ago. Um, this is for, truth and reconciliation is for all of us <laughs> in different yeah. ways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so uh, there, but there are lots of problems with what what I what what I see t taking place. Um, uh, righteousness. Somebody said to me, I think it's a great quote. I mean, righteousness is the currency of a postmodern age, so, mm -hmm. and, and and righteousness can be expressed in all kinds of ways that are anything but helpful uh you know a lot of a lot of what is said uh, a lot of what is pronounced a lot of the kind of tropes that are offered acknowledging you know who we are and what we've done and so forth and so on uh probably do more for the speaker than they do for anybody else it's a feel-good kind of thing you know i've done my thing i've acknowledged that i'm on you know unceded territory and you know that was stolen land and that i'm a settler and so forth and so on okay now let's get on with whatever it is we're doing here you know who is this for it, it makes the speaker feel good because they've done the right thing it's a righteous yeah. act i'm more interested in something that's meaningful whatever that is and I'm open to all kinds of possibilities and discussions and debate about it. We have to do something that's meaningful. And um, I mean, yeah, that's what I guess this has driven me to do a lot of the things that you know I've, I've done and I'm still doing. Um, you know, I was on. I'm. I'm currently right now. I'm reviewing, for example, um, applications made by Inuit to the. Um, residential school uh, under the residential school uh, settlement act that were turned back by the panel that that, that awards uh, compensation they were turned back because uh, somebody might have uh, applied for level two but what they reported was well, only qualifies them for level one compensation etc all kinds of other problems it's a difficult thing to do with COVID. I'm talking to people who know me sometimes and I don't know them just because yeah. I've been around helping them to reapply, which means I have to, they have to talk to me about their residential school experience. And that's what I'm listening to these days. You know, and I make sure there's somebody there to support them. I make sure that they're comfortable with me. I get help, you know, get to know me a little bit before we get into it. And then I, and then they talk about, you know, what happened to them. I write it down and then I write it up so that it can go into the forms that they have to submit. Um, you know, I know how to write and I have a good idea of, you know, what is required or what is needed. And I understand the context within which things happen, which are often something that's been missing, is missing and is still relevant to them make, really making the, their case so that they end up getting what they feel they're entitled to. But it's not easy work listening to this stuff. And it's, it, may, I, it, very, it makes me very nervous. I'm very, I'm on edge when I'm doing this a lot, to be quite honest, and maybe that's a good sign. But uh, uh, we need to act. We need to participate. We need to, my point is we need to work together. We all have different skills, different insights and different sensibilities that are important working together to deal with a terrible colonial history. And we need to help each other understand what happened and why. And we people have different understandings. I understand colonialism, as I've already said, and David Harvey says it nicely. It's, you know, capital accumulation by expropriation, coast to coast. 
Yeah, and it, it precedes capitalism too, in a way, doesn't it? If you think of, well, I mean, thinking about Wales and various people who came into Wales. And anyway, we won't go there now. I think we should go. To Sorry, you're Rodri. On, you're on mute. Why did I go to mute? So I'm I'm back on, right, Sandra? Yes, you're good. So now uh, let's let's see if we have any questions. I've you, you've opened up the chat room. I have a question for you to begin with, actually, Frank. It sort of picks up on what you were saying. Um, I mean, what, what, what can we do in a meaningful way, thinking about what you're dealing with in Pond Inlet? You're dealing with very large interests which have tremendous power. And, you know, I mean, we're individuals. I mean, we can be articulate about things. What would be meaningful for people like us well, to do, to help you? <clears throat> well, uh... One needs to, if you're going to do anything, has to understand what it is that one's dealing with. So becoming familiar with Baffinland and its activities, what it's planning and what those that means is a fair bit of work. But a lot of that information is online. Um, you know, if one looks up Baffinland and, you know, you can get a pretty good idea of who they're about and, uh, and um, you know, what they're, on, what they're, what they're planning. Um, Joyce Murray is the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Fisheries and Oceans is going to play a major role in this decision. There will be uh -huh. about four federal ministers. So lobbying with, you know, once one gets in touch with and understands what's going on, um, certainly lobbying with the ministers that are responsible for making the decision, and, and she's one of them, um, you know, um, makes, makes a difference. Um, uh, so, you know, people writing letters, uh, people raising their concerns, people, but, you know, again, one has to educate oneself about what's going on in order to do a, uh, an effective job of, of that. Uh, inviting, if you belong to an organization, inviting uh, someone to speak. Uh, uh, Lori Idlout is the uh, someone that I worked with because before she became the member of parliament, um, I, I was working with her as a, um, a re in relationship to the work I was doing in these five communities. Um, she was um, working with the community of Arctic Bay primarily uh, around the uh, impacts of, of this uh, mining development. Uh, you know, so Lori Idlout is also a uh, an MVP member of the uh, uh, federal government who's uh, someone who could come and speak and uh, talk about, you know, her experiences and what she sees and what's going on and what the problems are, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's, uh, no, there's some good beginnings. Thank you. Well, now there is a question from Nicola Hall. Hi, Frank. You may remember we were on the committee, uh, a committee for uh, restorative justice for Vancouver many uh, years ago. Um, she asks, you know, do you, do you think, and I'm doing a hash up job here, I uh, will use her words, not mine. Do you think we made any difference? I'm interested in what you were saying about a program in schools. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Good question. Um, well, it's always been a struggle uh, because, you know, the, the Vancouver Association for Restorative Justice is uh, certainly underfunded. It doesn't get any funding from the city, although we've asked for funding from the city uh, many times. Uh, small NGOs finding core money is just absolutely impossible these days. But we've had project funding. Um, the Law Foundation funded the work that we did with Renag Moriso, for example. Um, and we've had funding from a number of other sources as well over time. Um, What's happened, though, is uh, there was a problem in, I won't name the school, but there was a problem in, in, in one school that involved a student in a couple of classes, a teacher and two, class, two classes, a lot of conflict 
Uh, and uh, the principal was somewhat beside himself on how to deal with this. And somebody suggested that, uh, you know, he might talk to the Vancouver Association for Restorative Justice. So the outcome of that was that he found some money from the Vancouver School Board that allowed us to come in and do workshops with these students. Um, these were students in grade seven uh, and the teachers and use restorative, introduce them to restorative justice practice and then use circle work to uh, deal with the conflicts and problems that were causing so much difficulty. And we did, uh, myself and uh, two other members of the board who uh, one of whom is a Métis friend of mine who uh, uh, is an actor and is very interested in restorative justice and a, uh, and a young woman who's also had some training in restorative justice in the criminology department at Simon Fraser University. So we put together a, a, a series of workshops over a number of weeks and we went in and worked with the um, worked with the students and teachers and I gather it was a huge success uh, because you know we got all kinds of feedback from other people who'd heard about it but hadn't participated in it and eventually the Vancouver School Board got in touch with us and said look you know we've we've dismissed the police officers from uh, campuses in the Vancouver School Board District we've hired um, uh, youth workers to replace them, but we, we're looking for a model. We're looking for a way of going about dealing with some of the things that, uh, that confront us, which is conflict among students, uh, you know, uh, bullying, uh, racism, uh, you know, anti-Semitism, uh, and a long list of other isms and not so isms. Uh, would you like to do some training with our, um, our, our the youth workers that we've hired as, for a safe and caring school officers? So that's what we're doing. Uh, we've done some work with them uh, already. We're taking a bit of a break. COVID, of course, is absorbing a lot of the work, resources, energy, and time of teachers and school board, but uh, the principals in the Vancouver School District uh, indicated that they would like to do a workshop on restorative justice practice. So, so we're going to be working, with, probably end up working with the principals as well and informing them about you know, what restorative justice is and, and, and how it works. And of course, the thing about restorative justice is, you know, it owes a debt to indigenous peoples everywhere, not just in Canada, I mean, uh, in Mozambique and New Zealand, uh, all, all kinds of other places where in Vanuatu, uh, I mean, uh, restorative justice uh, loosely described as a way of dealing with conflict and difference and people who have done something, quote, wrong uh, as an alternative to Western legal, punitive legal systems, which, you know, um, take a sort of black and white approach. You know, somebody is guilty and somebody's innocent. That's, in my experience, doing restorative justice work, seldom the case. Um, so a lot of good things have happened. Uh, the work they're doing, doing with the Vancouver School Board, the play that we put together, um, um, we're getting somewhere, but it's taken a long time and a lot of work. That's great. Well, as long as I'm not missing any other questions, I, I, I don't see another question coming up unless I'm wrong, Sandra, you can double check for me. Um, it's very interesting, of course, the legislation to try and deal with social media. I sometimes think social media mangles society. And um, there's legislation on the books. So have you given any thought to that or been consulted at all, Frank? I mean, how do you deal with the fact that this marvelous instrument that we're using now is sort of like medieval heaven and hell? It's got wonderful things and some truly miserable things, including a lot of nastiness um, between people. Yeah, um, you know, we're living in a postmodern in terms of media, you know, go back and mm -hmm. uh, think of uh, the theorists that have always interested me. Uh, we're dealing with what I call postmodern mayhem. Yeah. Uh, and 
how does one turn back the clock or how does one move forward and produce a very different timepiece, uh, so to speak. Um, this is something that, uh, um, again, it, it, it's tied into the economy. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made from the mayhem that you're referring to. Um, <laughs> You know, Facebook uh, is doing whatever it needs to do to make money, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's doing anything good for the culture and society that we live in. If we do not find a way of reining in and regulating uh, the behavior of those who own and are making billions uh, from the social media that is causing so much trouble, um, we're going to all be in, and we already are in a lot of trouble. I mean, this is, uh, you know, capitalism gone off the rails, which is mm -hmm. what's inevitable. You know, this is postmodern capitalism, if you like, and it has very nasty uh, cultural and social implications. Yes. I mean, it go goes back to the beginning, you know, about uh, what is freedom and the, day, the problems of censorship and so on. Um, would you care to say a little bit more about that? Because that's, that's a really tangled web at it the moment. It goes right back to what I was saying before, you know, yeah. freedom and human rights are our discourse, and that's a problem. We have mm. neglected and we have failed when it comes to uh, discourse around uh, obligations and responsibilities. Yeah, you know, I, I not only have rights, I also have responsibilities. Yeah, and and that's very relevant to this debate about freedom versus you know a collective response to COVID. Uh, you know, people, some people are in the, on the rights side, and you know that it's a pendulum that moves back and forth. I would say, depending on what the issue is, sometimes there's an emphasis on rights which are often, most often, as I've already said, understood as individual rights. But there are other situations where the pendulum needs to go the other way. And responsibilities are the proper way of responding and dealing with whatever it is that's in front of us. Yeah. We've neglected, well, Judith, we've neglected that. We've neglected that side of the, the, the ledger altogether. Yes. Yes. Well, Judith Hall has asked a really good question that goes straight into that. So I'm taking you straight to on to Ottawa. How would social justice deal with the truck drivers? Less than 3% of truckers. Maybe you should talk to Justin. And not to us. <laughs> well, I think what they're doing is the, is the, uh, the right approach. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, uh, to say, it's the death of what's going on by a thousand cuts. I, I think it's yeah. a matter of uh, there's there are now any any fuel uh, going into a certain designated area is confiscated. It's a matter of cutting off the resources. Uh, anything else is going to lead to a nasty confrontation, and that's the sort of thing that one wants to avoid. The only problem is that you know cutting 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 this off, cutting off resources. Uh, and they need, of course, more, more people power to do this, but cutting off the flow of resources into the area where it's being occupied by, by these uh, truckers and others is one way of bringing things to a halt, but it's going, the problem is it's going to take time. Not something yeah, that's going to happen overnight. It's, 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 it's going to take uh, another 10 days or two weeks or whatever depending on the resources that they have to bring to bear. And, yes, and, and it, I think that's in the interests of all of us and to avoid uh, confrontation and violence, uh, bringing in the military, which I think she goes right, that you want know, to be really cautious of doing something like that. Absolutely. You know, that, that's, the, that's the only way to do it. But we have to keep talking. You know, we have to keep the, 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 the discussion going. And if we keep it, and it's not, it's not just a matter of trying to convince somebody that they're wrong and we're right. It's a matter of listening. It's a matter of thinking. It's a matter of appreciating and understanding the feelings that 
people have and how what has brought them to the positions that they are occupying and what they're articulating to the greatest extent possible. Not easy to do. But something worth trying. No, I understand that. I mean, I think um, my... Uh, I have a question. Oh, uh, go, great. Well, go, ask it away, I Fred, go. please. Well, I am myself impressed by your accomplishments and, uh, and I'm also kind of puzzled by your acute understanding of modern Marxism, Western Marxism, and uh, I want to know how you profess that and get away with what you're doing. Because my experience of being a radical is there's a, a lot of opposition, which is uh, very difficult to cope with. Well, that's a good question. Um, and it could take me a long time to do it justice. Uh, so I just want to say I appreciate the question. I, 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 I grew up in a very working class Scottish Canadian immigrant family. Uh, my father worked in a gas station pumping gas and then he got a job in a factory, a machine tool factory, you know, delivering bits and pieces to people working at lathes and drills and presses and things. He, uh, he could barely read and, and write. Uh, he went back to school and learned how to be a draftsman. He could handle numbers and drawing quite nicely. And he also could read music. He played the clarinet. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I grew up in a very different culture. Uh, it was one that, you know, Highland Games every summer, <laughs> um, a porridge uh, every morning, every day of the year, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. A, a fair bit of um, poverty, but parents who didn't want to show just how little resources they had. So they did a great job of uh, putting on appearances, you know, so that they fit in. My father was indentured labor, by the way, which is a real surprise. People don't know that we had indentured labor in Canada, but I have his papers of indentiture and they're horrifying. When I first read them, my mother gave them to me after he died and said, I've never shared these with anybody. You, you might be interested in them. I, I read it and I wept. It was appalling, absolutely appalling. He was basically sold to this company for five, on a five-year contract which governed everything in his life, not just his working hours, but his personal life as well. I shared it with James Struthers, who's a, 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 at P, uh, Trent University in Peterborough, who said it's one of the best examples that he'd ever seen of indentured labor in Canada. And he said, most people have no idea that we had such a thing in the late 20s and 30s when people were desperate. They often sold their kids to companies for conditions which were utterly appalling. So, you know, that's what I grew up with. Uh, so, you know, by my interest in, in labor and, and, and class, uh, how people were treated is, is stuck with me. I, I got very interested in the Frankfurt School, though. I was not, I, I, there was something about Marxism that was both uh, attracted me and repelled me at the same time. I thought there was some, some of the deck was missing. I was very interested in existentialism. Jean-Paul Sartre is probably the theoretical figure that has dominated most of my reading and interest. Uh, I think his novels and plays are as interesting as his philosophical works. La Nausée is a brilliant, <laughs> absolutely brilliant novel. Um, and, and, and a lot of other people around it, the work of Simone de Beauvoir launched like a second wave feminism. Uh, the Frankfurt School, Herbert Marcuse. Uh, yeah, I, I got into all of that. Uh, David Harvey uh, more recently. Uh, um, so I, I would call myself, I'm kind of an existential Marxist in some ways. I, 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 we live, we make the world in which we live and, and the world that we make turns around and lives us. There's a real dialectic there, which many people have, uh, uh, struggled with in many different ways. The, the, the literature that came out of the six, 50s, 60s, and 70s around this is absolutely fabulous stuff. Hannah uh, Arden, for example, uh, you know her, her work on totalitarianism, her experiences as a as a Jewish refugee in the United States. Uh, Herbert Marcuse's works on uh, repressive desublimation. Uh, you know, 
rich stuff. Uh, so I've gotten away with it because uh, I, I, I sort of I wallow in the richness of it. I, I, I can go off in a lot of different directions. And, and, and well, now look, the, I'm, I'm not dogmatic in other words. <laughs> No, no, obviously not, Frank. Well, look, there are two more questions at least, and, and I think we, the people can ask them directly. I think that makes this more interesting, actually, from Bob Ratner and then Anne George. And I think, Mia, you can bring them in, if that's possible. Am I, am I on? Do you, Frank, you are, Bob. Me? Yes. Yep, you're on, Bob. Hello, Frank. Um, Hello. I, uh, not long ago, I heard an indigenous speaker who was seeing the importance of stating these acknowledgements at the start of one's talk to whomever or wherever, acknowledgements about being on unceded, um, you know, indigenous ground. And I politely uh, questioned that, um, suggesting that it might be little more than a hollow tribute. And she replied that uh, as people state, state these acknowledgements and hear them over and over, eventually they'll get to believe them and that will set the stage for the next move toward reconciliation. You think that's a realistic expectation? Uh, yes and no. I think some people may, but you know the other impact is uh, people will just get tired of it, you know, and turn off. Uh, I don't think there's any one uh, one one outcome. I think both uh, outcomes are, are possible. Uh, my point is that this is necessary but not sufficient. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you, you have to be doing something else. Uh, other than just, you know, uh, uh, hearing the words. Uh, there's a practice that has to go with this if it's going to mean anything. That's my point. Well, Grant, should we bring in Anne? Uh, <clears throat> yes, you certainly could. Uh, hi, Frank. I remember you well from the Circumpolar Health Conferences. Uh, I didn't have a question, though. So are you sure it's not somebody else's question? Because I no, didn't you're, pose you're, a... you're up for a question, Anne. So uh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> all, I can say, sure all I can say is, Frank, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. You've uh, you've have you've had such vast experience and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Fred's question was helpful to to lead to the next discussion, but I didn't really have a question for you. <laughs> I'll praise okay. you and well, I'll praise you instead. Yeah, well, if, if if you come up with it, save it for the next circumpolar uh, conference. <laughs> well, actually, unfortunately, we're getting near the end of our time. Are there uh, anybody else um, coming in with a question? I have well, one I... more. Yes, yes, please, Fred. Well, uh, uh, it seems to me that you are doing things which involve the iron cage of bureaucracy. And my version of the other question would be, how, I, I understood in Mozambique that you had that Christian organization which organized with you. Uh, what kind of social support did you get in uh, the important areas uh, from organizations? Because my understanding of how all this works is capitalism accumulates a lot, but there are people who object. And so I heard less of the people who object with you in your talk. And I was interested in how much of that you have. You mean how many people uh, took issue with or objected to what we were doing? You're you're on mute, Fred. You're you're you've muted. Well, I tell you what. We'll see if Mia can get. Apparently, Cole Harris has got a question. Um, if we could bring him in, I'm sorry, Fred, but just for the moment, should we bring in Cole Harris and see if Mia can 
explain about the muting. Cole's on mute. Cole? He's also muted. Oh, Mia, apparently they're both muted now. Can we unmute them? Okay, I'm off mute. Oh, yes. People have to unmute. Themselves. Okay, well, good. Sorry about that. Come in, Cole, please. Well, thank you. We'll go back to Fred. This is a fascinating ramble through an extraordinary career. Just a word about, about settlers. I agree with you completely that, uh, that uh, conditions in the background of many people leaving were atrocious, that people were really being thrown out, that they were indeed refugees. Uh, and, uh, but they do come, they do take up land, they do with enormous difficulty clear it. Some survive, many survive in the process. Eventually there is cleared land. People are living on it. They are in a sense settlers. Uh, the uh, uh, farmlands spread out along the Lower St. Lawrence during the French regime. They spread out in Southern Ontario uh, in the 19th century more quickly because this pace of migration is, 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 is faster. These are settlements. They're set the settlements occupied by at least in one vocabulary by, by settlers. What's wrong with calling these people settlers? Well, they, they, they are settlers, they settle. But when we use the term settler, we are also passing judgment, if you like. We are also making all kinds of assumptions about the consciousness that lay behind what they were doing and, uh, and how it is they came to be occupying land and taking up space. We are making all kinds of assumptions, or maybe even worse, we're making no assumptions because we, we haven't even thought about it. Uh, my point is that the use of the term settler without reference to, without any reference to who was responsible for what happened is to mask something that's incredibly important to appreciating and understanding not only what happened then, but what is still happening now. In other words, you know, let's look at the people who organized this. Let's look at the people who, you know, let's look at the Canadian Pacific Railway, for example, when it came to the prairies and how the prairies ended up getting settled. Who's driving this? Who's, who's responsible? What was the consciousness of the people who, you know, were ref as I call them, refugees who came and I'll use the word because it's appropriate and settled here. You know, what were, what were they, what did they think they were doing? What did they understand about what they were part of compared to the people, for example, who had the land grants and who owned and controlled the resources that were being farmed out to them or not farmed out, but being cut down as in cutting down trees or whatever. Uh, you know, the, the term settler as we use it masks this history. And I see that as hugely problematic. Both of you, would you would you allow me to bring back Fred because Fred is now not muted. So Fred, can you perhaps wrap up the questions for us? Oh, perhaps not, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure you can. <laughs> uh, I, I was interested in all your work and admired it, uh, but there was less of in your talk about the people who supported you in all this. And uh, that, that's my, you know, that, that there's always a question of when you talk about the terrible things that take place is they're not all going on without real anger and opposition and fighting and uh, organizing. And my experience, is, dealing with other people who are in so other social movements is that my role as an academic and all that is to build up the people who will take care of it uh, rather than to be the person that takes care of it. But I think yours is a very powerful position in which you work through uh, the iron cage of bureaucracy and I want to know what kind of support you have. Um, 
I, not, I would, not I would, your life. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've had uh, a, a lot of support and uh, a lot of good support. Uh, a lot of the uh, support that I had for work I did with Inuit Youth was from SHRC, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. I had, I had lots and lots of grants over the years from SHRC for the work that I was doing with Inuit Youth. Um, Cernac, the uh, that branch of the federal government, is, was responsible for paying me to work with the Inuit communities on the northern tip of, uh, of, of uh, Canada. Indigenous relations uh, paid me to work, do the work that I was doing with the uh, communities around the Baffin land mine expansion to make sure that people were you know, informed about the technical and other implications of uh, what was being planned. Uh, the Law Foundation of uh, British Columbia is responsible for funding the work that I've done with restorative justice in the city of Vancouver that I talked about. Um, the Canadian International Development Agency, um, CUSO, um, NOVIB, which is a Dutch NGO, uh, and a number of other non-governmental organizations funded work that I did in Tanzania. And, and in Mozambique, CUSO funded work that I did at Vanuatu in the South Pacific. Uh, you know, uh, but generally, uh, you know, I, I've had a fair bit of funding and support for the work that I've done from organizations that have um, you know, let me do what I propose to do. Alas, I have to call um, this fascinating time with you, Frank, uh, to a close um, and to invite everybody to join us again on the 22nd of March when uh, Fez Descali is going to speak about his insights and experience. I, I wonder, I don't know whether you would feel this is appropriate, Frank, but I was fascinated and touched, if I may say so, by what you put at the end of your email. And, and maybe that's the best way of, of summing up the time we, we've had together and a recognition of your remarkable uh, contribution. Uh, people are like snowflakes. No two are alike, but we all melt together. Thank you so much, Frank. And thank everybody for being with us. And I look forward to seeing you on the 22nd of March. Thank you again. Okay. Thanks to everyone for the questions and uh, thank you the opportunity to speak.